Brian Mellonarf, yeah. Executive Director of Hyperledger, Mitchell Baker, the Chief Lizard Wrangler of the Mozilla Foundation uh, and the Mozilla Corporation and kind of the conglomerate, right? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I think Dakota was really passionate about having you here and about having kind of both of us up here. Um, I think because this community is talking an awful lot about a piece of the internet architecture that has been kind of underserved for so long, right? We kind of, we got the messaging kind of thing done and it goes and it's all sorts of different directions. We got the web protocols thing done. Um, and by the way, Mitchell and I first met, uh, was 98 when we first met or was it even before then when um, uh, AOL uh, uh, was looking at a future for the web browser that they had um, uh, and this uh, crazy idea of releasing it as open source software kind of emerged. Um, uh, and and I, think, I think this community is really interested in what, you know, that whole kind of combined picture of kind of open standards, open source software, uh, but how do we build things that are, are self-sustaining and, and become uh, kind of something that can be uplifting technology, right? So what I wanted to try to do is kind of set a picture for everybody of kind of um, uh, where that came from and where it's heading to from here. So if you could kind of just tell us kind of, it, f f go back 20 years, what was the rationale, what was the thinking that, that kind of got the Mozilla project, even before it became an open source, or be, before it became its own nonprofit, the, the, the rationale and, and, and kind of your role in that, but uh, um, uh, what was, the, what was the, the case that was yeah. made to, to, AOL, to make AOL to, to throw in on that, make that happen? I would say that there are two significant points in getting Mozilla to where it is, uh, or an open source sort of global infrastructure for technology. One was the AOL phase, and then one was when we became independent. The AOL phase was very market-based. Uh, it was essentially uh, can't, can't actually compete in the market as a single organization, and so that brought in the idea of, well, maybe a shared asset, you know, a piece of technology that we all built together and then used together would allow both the aggregation of resources, uh, which is hard to do for a big project, um, and also enough uses to be important in the market. Because, you know, sometimes you, you, you might want a small solution that isn't like globally interoperable, it isn't the one giant platform that, you know, rules them all, sort of. Um, uh, but, but with the internet or the web itself, there are fundamental layers at the standards layer where you want an, an implementation that is near universal. And those are usually large projects to get done. And so the, the first piece was maybe a community-based approach of sharing the work to build something and the uses. Um, and when you share the use of something like that, it, uh, you have to give people control. And so that really led to open source. It's not a business arrangement of you know, I, whoever, will allow you to use something on my terms. If you want people to really invest in it and feel like I can build on this, the, the idea that you can actually do what you want, which is what open source gives you, was really important. Yeah. And then the second piece was when we became independent outside of AOL and made it clear that we were public benefit, you know, not just open source, but public benefit, not private benefit, not a shareholder company, but trying to build a public asset at that uh, foundation. Right. Right, and um, I mean, it, it sounds crazy that a nonprofit should be building code, right? And eventually we did develop this hybrid kind of model of a nonprofit owning a for-profit to kind of help with a lot of the complexities of that. Um, but, but around the Mozilla culture, I hear this echo of uh, this, you remember the line from the movie Tron, we fight for the user, right? <laughs> um, and sure. could you talk a little bit about that, about that kind of culture, how much does that frame kind of the decisions that are made around the product uh, and the kinds of relationships you forge and kind of the, the reason why Mozilla exists? Yeah, Mozilla has two strands. Um, we have the fight for the user strand and we have the what we would call the fight for the web or the platform itself piece. Uh, and I don't know if the latter is as equally important to, to this community, so I'll just say one word about it and stop. But, but we think that the web is, a, or the internet today, is interoperable, at one point near universal, depending on government action, um, is an important place because it allows new players to, you know, new systems to plug into. But the fight for the user is, you know, why bother? Like, who cares about a system? Open, closed, elegant, who cares if the user experience isn't good that comes out of it? And so, we use product to actually try to drive what, what is that human experience. And it turns out today, of course, you know, you hear that all over product companies. User-centered design is you know, sort of 
everywhere now. And, and so in a way, I, you know, it's become mainstreamed. I don't know if that means it's watered down or not. Like, I'm not well, sure that that's good, but... Uh, it, it, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, was, I said that... Like, why bother to do something unless you really care about the result? And so the result would be, like, what happens to people at the end of it? Uh, and when you, as we have been looking at the web as a whole, you know, sometimes the experiences are good. We're not 100% focused on refugees or on um, vulnerable populations needing assistance. It's, it includes that, but it's broader. So, so sometimes you have, like, very positive and happy results. Um, but increasingly, you see, even in the happy world, it's easy for people to be abused or, or manipulated. So we try to build that into the product. We try to give everybody who's actually writing code like that sort of mindset as to why are you doing this. I was going to say, I think one example of that is, you know, the, the advertising uh, model that much of the web is based on has come with a lot of complications, shall we say. Um, and, there, you know, there wasn't much of an organized user resistance to that until you started to see the emergence of ad blocking plugins, right? right. Uh, and, and then things like do not track out, of the, out there, which, uh, you know, didn't, wasn't as successful perhaps as it could have been, partly because it was a, a, an entirely voluntary system. Uh, but, but in some ways, I think the product strategy at Mozilla was to say there's a balancing act to be struck between the interests of the, the users, right, uh, and, and the interests of the people creating content online. Um, and, and does that inform kind of the, the other, are there other examples of product decisions perhaps inside of Mozilla where you've really had to kind of weigh those and say, hey, we're one of the few organizations that is really thinking about these end users? Oh, yes. You know, almost every decision about privacy. Like, we've been trying to build privacy into, like, browsers or whatever we're doing for a long time but mm -hmm. but but it turns out like privacy I mean in an ID community this would be clear like privacy and security are sort of intention and convenience and security are intention and so most of what's built as tech, you know internet technology today is all about speed and convenience um, and very little about privacy and security and user control and so you know even in the areas where we, we've been successful. I mean, earlier you said we succeeded at some things. We never really did get a good identity system at, at, a, at the platform layer. Um, and, and we tried a few times. I tried probably a decade ago, and then we tried probably about five or six years ago. Um, and we found that was in the period when Facebook was actively just spewing data. And so we found that a lot of websites, even though we had a federated you know, identity system that, that worked technically, we, the whole value point was not to provide user data. And so it wasn't interesting as a product, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So there's a, so a kind of set of reasons why you know ID, uh, uh, you know, on the, on, on the internet is so fragmented, and, or sorry, non-existent and fragmented unless you're Facebook. Um, uh, but anyway, increasingly now we are we're starting to get signals back from the market about privacy. So it's easier to actually build privacy into a product and offer it. You know, like every time you offer someone a choice or a preference, do you want to use this or not? For a lot of people, that's a drawback. Mm -hmm. And so, so every time you even, we think of choice as good, but, but for a lot of people, choice is not good. <laughs> it's just confusing, and, and you don't know what to do. And so we're actually starting to see, um, in a more general sense, an interest real in, in privacy and security and being willing to have something that's not as stripped down as possible. Do you think so? So the, the right the internet is rife with the kind of this legacy of a lot of well-intentioned uh, individuals working together to try to build different identity standards and identity systems, um, <clears throat> and and even the best resourced efforts seem to have kind of run on rocky shoals on that. Um, what do you think is there is there something that is different now or something that might change in the future that makes bringing these groups together, bringing these what has to change? Let me put it that way. What has to change to make um, <clears throat> a, a standard emerge? that might have the same degree of ubiquitous adoption and success that HTTP, CSS, HTML, like, you know, SMTP and DNS, right? Like, they could become infrastructural and, and ubiquitous. Yeah. Well, I would say consumer demand, right? Because I think many of the, the people who build identity systems, um, many of us, or who have old ones, would be happy, <laughs> you know, to consolidate or have a standard. Um, but I think part of it is somebody's got to drive that. So there's got to be a use case. And, and what are the use cases that, that drive things? And so, for example, like a refugee use case is a very clear one. 
may not be a system that's going to drive the market. So first online, big online identity system, Apple, mm -hmm. driven by music. <laughs> right? so, um, so, so what are those things? Would actual security and safety be a use case that will drive hundreds of millions of people to create a new identity? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Uh, I think today, probably not. You know, if things get worse in the future, maybe. Um, you know, maybe there's some other technical thing that doesn't really have a policy goal, maybe AR, or, you know, I mean, maybe something will happen that causes driving a new identity where you can get a mass consumer market and then get a standard which is really widely adopted. Um, I think that there may be, in the human rights and through the SDG, um, the folks on the SDGs, I think there may be a government use case that could drive some adoptions, um, hopefully done with good right. identity. Um, but but uh, there has got to be something, right? I actually think that the standardization and the technical, um, what would the infrastructure be, may be the easier question. Mm -hmm. Doing it in a way that you can take it with you that's super na na ugh, sorry, <laughs> supranational. Like yeah. those are complex technical problems, but I, I think that we could, could, are on the way and, and may solve those. Yeah. Now, Mozilla, the foundation side, has been fairly active in um, calling out uh, actors out there who are not necessarily doing what we think would be the right thing. An example of this has been Aadhaar, right? Yes. Um, I, could you talk a little bit about Mozilla's position on, on Aadhaar and, and kind of uh, where, is it, is it something that can be improved? Is it, you know, what, <laughs> is it a lesson or is it something that uh, um, uh, is, a, is a dumpster fire, uh, as people would say? <laughs> um, like, uh, where, could you yeah. first, like, just tell them what the position is if you, if, uh, and, then, and then we can talk about it. Well, uh, so the Mozilla position is that the user needs to be at the center and privacy and security are, are fundamental. And, yeah. you know, your biometrics, I mean. But I heard it's unhackable. Yeah, right, and and nothing's ever happened to it. Um, sorry, I had a train of oh, so you know we have these two two often two groups of people who um, it, oh, I just have to say it. it just feels a little in some ways like other for you know politics and other places where you have the need the clear need for identity for a whole range of, in this case, development goals that are you know, really clear and obvious. And so the, the people uh, you know, who are saying, hey, you know, but security and my control really matters, you know, it, it sounds a lot like we don't care <laughs> about providing identity. And, and then um, you, you have the other view where it, it certainly sounds sometimes like some of these actors don't, like the, the security problems just don't feel real. Or they feel, I think more likely, they feel tiny compared to the potential benefits of being able, if the vision were true. And so I, I think, you know, our position on Aadhaar probably, every, you know, plenty of people here, you know, know a fair amount about it, but we keep trying to find a way of like, uh, like we need to crack this system of A, you either care about identity and not security, or, you know, or the other way around. And, and, um, you know, I, 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 that's a case in which the, the, like the pilots and the other projects that are going on that can begin to actually demonstrate something else is possible are, are just fundamental. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that we'll be able to crack that until we can show, yep, you could actually do something that's different and here it is and, and it's working yeah. uh, to, to try and crack that. Are there other examples of where um, Mozilla has worked with government agencies with other private sector companies to kind of talk about that role of the fight for privacy, the fight for security uh, online, uh, but also in a kind of open standards and open source software context? Other engagements you've had with DC or Pri Brussels or? Oh, yeah, so, so we do that, you know, yeah. uh, I, I would say pretty constantly. We've, we've been active in a, in a range of the privacy and security pieces. I thought you were going to ask if there are other places where we try to bridge the gap between um, two like good intentions. Um, and I would say that um, zero rating uh, is an area where 
we've also tried to be active in that fight of, oh, are, are, fami well, are people familiar with the term of zero rating? Um, uh, 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 you're obviously familiar with net neutrality, though, right? Zero rating is <clears throat> uh, something that's been done quite a bit in the developing world to offer free Facebook uh, to people who have a cell phone plan that rates them very much on a per kilobyte basis, but to say, hey, all your traffic to Facebook is free, uh, but it obviously creates an anti-competitive and net neutrality kind of, kind of issue, so I'm sorry. Uh, and it's an issue where we've just confused, should there be subsidies <laughs> for data? Uh, and if there are, um, uh, how do they work? Right. So maybe that's a tangent that's a, that, that isn't worth going into too much of the details of, just to say that these classic policy questions where on the one hand you don't care about the people who are unconnected, Facebook is better than nothing, uh, and on the other hand, well, maybe it's not like socially or even individually good, trying to bridge that gap um, to get to some kind of resolution. We, it almost begs the question, how does somebody who, who wants to see a positive outcome for society, a positive <laughs> outcome, yeah. you know, whether you're coming or wearing the hat of a, of, a, of a government bureaucrat, a civil society organization, a yeah, nonprofit right. believer, or a vendor, right, who wants to build yeah. things, how do you make sure you go in and, and, and build something that actually has public benefit through technology? And I mean, like, like I'm sure people at Facebook well-intentionedly thought, hey, giving people access to Facebook would mean, you know, some, some positive benefit out there beyond brand. Um, be, you know, connecting people is a, is, a, is a good thing, right? And then to discover how it got used in Myanmar, for example, has probably shocked them as much as it shocked the rest of us. Um, are there templates here? Are there, way, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, you've got two questions. One, one, how could you try and figure things out? And two, yeah. what about Facebook? So I'd like to set <laughs> Facebook aside for, 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 for a moment here. Um, you know, it's, it's actually not magic, I think. You know, when you're designing one of these systems, if you don't have the classic devil's advocates in the room, you're probably going to make mistakes like this. If you this. don't have your critics in the room. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right, because it is that, what are the different perspectives? Um, how do you, I mean, how do you ask the unthinkable question? What is it? Like, how do you challenge yourself? And so it's very uncomfortable. So the design of a lot of these things probably should be much more uncomfortable <laughs> than, they, than they are in many settings. And that's easy to say. Yeah. Like, like going into your own workplace, like me at Mozilla, and saying, hey, you know, we've got to be more uncomfortable. Like, that's a... Nobody really wants that, however. <laughs> but, but, but you really don't want these problems after the fact either. Um, and I don't know, like trying to build something good. Like, like, I mean, uh, you know, there's been this sense of technology that anything is good <laughs> as long as it, you know, works for somebody. But, but those, it, it really is, I think, this, uh, the, the, the dynamic tension between different values. Mm -hmm. um, because clearly, if you're building a secure system, it has to be usable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's hard to do. Like either one alone is hard enough, but getting the two of them together. And so I, I think that product iteration is really important. Um, and I also, another reason I'm such an uh, advocate of open source and open standards is to enable more product experimentation where you can take pieces of different things. If it doesn't work, you can learn from it. Um, where there's some inner interoperability if you're working from a standard, because we a, a lot of this experimentation will be small, or you'll have a pilot design for one user community that there may be a template, but it may not necessarily be interoperable. So how do you get the various different experimentations to help move the whole industry forward. It seems there's a tension between saying, you know, be very careful about what you build and try to be thoughtful in every way about how it might be misused with, right. um, let's experiment. Let's let's get our hands dirty with code. Let's build things. And and if things don't work out, you know, be willing That's to true. throw it away and, and do a second, a second iteration of that. Um, how has Mozilla managed that tension out there? Um, like, are there te techniques? Are there tips? Are there, like... Oh, yeah. Well, we, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because we, we struggled with it for a long time. Um, you do not really experiment much in a browser. Um, and, and because, you know, there's a lot of talk to, I mean, all the glamours in phones, but there's still, uh, you know, a lot of hours spent in browsers. And, and you really don't experiment in them. They're just too complicated. And, and most people do not like any change. Uh, so so um, we have uh, designed systems where you find populations of people who want to test. And then we have some very careful, what are the smaller groups where you can do some testing? Um, do you share both successes and failures? Yeah. 
yeah, kind of well, have to share the failure side, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is very interesting, like the human reaction to fear and discomfort, how often it is to close up. Yeah. Um, and there's a set of people for whom that's not true. Uh, I think you find many of them in open source, but, but it, it certainly is a, is a human nature piece. But, but I think your point, because I might have been glib, about piloting and experimentation does sound a little bit like, oh, just try things. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Uh, but but with user identity, it actually it actually does matter. Um, so I would say that there, you, you, in a, I'll say in the Mozilla case, not in the in the pilots. You, you know, the, uh, the, this org is funding, uh, which I can't speak to. But certainly, experimenting in smaller scales and things that don't, uh, you know, aren't physical safety right. pieces right. as much, and finding ways to. Um, to, to work on one variable at a time, right? Trying to solve everything all at once. If you've got five different variables that you're trying to juggle to get right, that's really you know exponentially hard to get it both secure and usable. So trying to isolate what particular piece is the most important. Um, right. Okay. Cool. Well, we're out of time. Um, thank you very much oh, for the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.